Good morning. If you want to come and take their seats, we're going to be starting the service in the next uh, minute or so, I'd say. Good morning. Um, my name is Dylan. I'm a member here at Broadmead Baptist Church and a very warm welcome, well, actually a slightly nippy welcome uh, to Broadmead Baptist on this uh, Sunday morning. Um, if you are regular here and you've been coming here for years, then you, welcome. And if it's your first time here, um, we're so pleased to have you here as well. And it's, it's great to be able to, be able to meet together um, and worship God together and to hear from his word together. Um, I haven't got too much to say in terms of things going on to, to mention to you specifically, but um, for this week, just to let everyone know, it's prayer meeting this uh, Tuesday rather than home group. So we'll be meeting in the upper room, um, so like just up the stairs from here at 8 p.m. on Tuesday rather than having regular home groups. Um, so it'd be great to have as many people as possible coming along to that to be able to, to speak to God together um, and to encourage one another in prayer. Um, and the other thing I just quickly going to mention is um, I've just been given this, a very exciting leaflet. Um, so it's about the Women's Christmas event, which is happening on the 30th of November uh, here in the Wadlow Hall. So just the hall across the way. Um, I, men, I'm afraid you can't come to this, but for women who are in the church, uh, this is a great opportunity to have time together um, with fellowship with one another, but also a chance to invite friends who you, wanna, uh, who want, you want to share the gospel with as well. Um, to come along for an event. I think usually it's some really fun crafts. Uh, there's usually good nibbles. Um, so please come along to that. If you want to find out more, you can scan the QR code there or have a chat with Claire, who is somewhere. There she is, waving at the back. Thank you, Claire. Um, wonderful. We're going to come to a time of uh, worshipping God together now. So I'll invite the band up. Um, and for people, if you're not used to church, if it's your first time at church, this might seem like a slightly unusual thing to do that that Christians always sing together but actually since um, the earliest time that Christians were around since Christ was on earth and even before that God's people have always been singing um, and singing worship to and singing praise to him for what he's done um, and the other thing I was going to mention is we're doing the Bible in two years at the moment uh, as a church which some of you lots of you are probably aware of some people may not be aware of and and this week we've been in the book of Romans um, and specifically today was in the the Romans 7. And there's a verse at the end of Romans 7 which says, Oh, what a miserable person am I who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death. Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. And today, as we sing, as we give glory to God, we are praising Jesus Christ because He is the answer. He is why we're meeting together. We're not just doing this because we, we want to. We're coming to church because we, we believe in sort of moralism or being better people or somehow by following rules we're going to be like you know sorted out in life but because Jesus Christ is the answer and all the songs that we're singing today are focusing our eyes on Jesus and giving the glory to him that he he deserves because of what he's done for us and we're going to be hearing a bit more about that later um so if you want to join me and stand I'm going to pray for us as we start Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for his death and for his resurrection. Father, we thank you that through him we have life, that we have fullness of life, that we have freedom, that we have liberty. We thank you that he is glorious. We thank you that he is kind. We thank you that he is merciful to us. And Father, I pray that as we sing to you, as we sing about what Christ has done for us, may you be pleased with our worship. Father, may we be built up and encouraged um, by singing to you now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. No more, he is. 
is the greatest gift of all. The one who angel hosts the door now has me safely in his hold. My life, my life, is death my death. Oh, my, his every righteous breath. My precious child, the Father Christ, when all of Christ is all of mine. Christ is mine. If Christ is mine, my guilt is gone. It died with him upon the tree. The weight of sin I held so long was laid on Jesus' death for me. Oh, sweet forgiveness, precious peace, condemn no more, my soul is free. My weary burden cast aside when all of Christ is all of mine. Christ is mine, I will not fear, though many stand against his name. Above their noise, his voice is clear, behold, I overcome the grave. My living Lord, my risen King, was left to fear if I'm with him. For death is swallowed up in life When all of Christ is all of mine What joy to know What joy to know That Christ is mine Who holds me ever in His love The sure foundation of my life Whose grace will always be enough. Though all I have is stripped away, still I rejoice for Christ remains. And when He comes, He'll lift me high, for all of Christ is all of mine. the crimson river left my burdens on the shore I went down a sinner came up a saint I with Christ now I'm reborn yes he washed me with his mercy and he cleansed me with his blood now I stand complete I have been set free, I found life now in the flood. Now the same, I am changed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. By His grace, I am saved, I'm His child forever, I am. Hallelujah. Blood of the Lamb. Now I have the living water from the well that won't run dry. All the pangs of life have been satisfied by the precious blood of Christ. the blood of the Lamb. By His grace, I am 
saved. I'm his child forever. I am. Hallelujah. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. When it's time to cross that river. I will shine in glorious light. When he calls me home, I'll fall at his throne and forever worship Christ. And forever worship Christ. And forever worship Christ. And forever worship Christ. Not the same. blood of the Lamb, by His grace I am saved, I'm His child forever I am, not the same, I am changed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, by His grace I am saved, I'm His child forever I am.
Thank you that because of Christ, we can come before you freely. And freely you gave it all for us. We pray this morning that as we hear from God's word, as we pray together, that we will encounter the living Christ. We thank you for the delight it is to know him and to love him. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Um, this is a point that the children and young people are going to be heading out to their groups. I think we've got a, a new slide to help point people in the right direction. It's great with arrows and everything. So um, well, I'm trying to remember which way we're going. Crash, this way. Sparklers, with the ages as well on the screen, all going this way. And then Explorers and Connect all going this other direction. And while we're doing that, um, and they're heading to their groups. If you just want to sit and have a chat with someone you haven't met before, maybe sat around you and just have a talk about what's been going on in your week um, and how you're doing. Great. We can continue those coffees a bit later over, or continue those conversations a bit later over some coffee. Um, uh, Leonie's going to come and lead us in a time of prayer now, and then Hannah's going to open up um, God's word for us uh, and read it for us. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for who you are and for the generosity that you show us every day. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who has given us new life. 
Help us all to be transformed and being more like him every day. Thank you, Lord, for the two-year Bible plan and how we've been learning more about you together. Thank you for home groups and the blessing that it is to meet together and support each other through the ups and downs of life. Father, we come to you with everything that is going on in our world. And we pray particularly this week for the elections in America. Father, we pray there will be a peaceful transfer of power and that you would bring your peace and healing. We pray for unity over division and for love to triumph over hate, regardless of the outcome. We also pray for our brothers and sisters around the world facing persecution. And today we pray particularly for Burkina Faso, where more than 200 Christians have been killed in recent attacks. We pray for those who mourn that they will be comforted. And we pray that the government of Burkina Faso will be able to contain the violence. We pray too for our mission partners, Peter and Louise Lynch in Bangladesh. Will you continue to use them for your kingdom? We also lift up other friends, Britt, James, and Dan, and others who are serving you overseas in different capacities. Lord, protect them physically and spiritually, that they may grow closer to you wherever they are. And finally, Lord, we pray for our city. We pray for those in positions of power, that you would give them wisdom in governing well. We pray for local businesses, schools, and hospitals. And we lift to you those who are finding it difficult to make ends meet. Lord, help us find ways to help those who are struggling. And finally, we pray for our brothers and sisters who are gathered in churches around this city, just as we are this morning. May we together be a blessing to those around us and display your love until you come. Let us now pray as Jesus taught us to pray with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, Great. Um, if you have a Bible near you or your phone, um, it'd be great to open up to Job. Um, we're going to be reading chapter one and chapter two. Chapter one. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going to and fro on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your power. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day, when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the eldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing, and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabaeans attacked and made off with them. 
they put the servants to the sword, and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants. I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the eldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going to and fro on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil, and he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me to, against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied, a man will give all he has for his life. But now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Then Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Namathite heard about all the troubles that had come upon him. They set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. Great. I'll just pray for you, Mark. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that we have a space here um, where you'll be speaking through Mark to us, Lord. And I just pray you'd speak powerfully through him now. Um, yeah, I just pray that in our hearts, would you bring about um, yeah, the knowledge of you that you want to impart to us today. Um, so I pray you give him all wisdom in this. In your name, amen. So before I begin, I just wonder if we can go for the first slide of the, the building on the rock again. Um, churches have funny ways of organizing themselves. Um, e even as a churchman, I know that. We, it's, uh, many churches, you have uh, basically a, the minister who does everything, and every, everybody else just kind of enjoys what he does, and, and they don't have any responsibility for it because he's just doing it all. Uh, we don't function that way here at Broadmead. Um, at Broadmead, uh, the past... Do you have this, the first slide up? At, at Broadmead, the, the pastors are, are, are part of a group of elders, and the elders take day-to-day -day decisions for the church. Uh, but what happens is that the elders are responsible to the members, and the members are the ones who uh, say yes or no in the long term to any major decisions. So... For the elders, uh, a members' meeting is very important because we're speaking to the whole body of the church and we're asking, what do you think about these situations and can you please give us what you, what you would like to see done. And so in our church, church membership has a high premium. Church membership is important to us and because people who are church members are part of the, are, are part of the program. They're sharing with us. They're giving financially. They're, they're part of this. They're serving here in the church. And people who are members are able to take leadership roles in the church. 
Um, so this uh, Thursday evening, I think at 7.30, we're going to be having one of our Building on the Rock sessions. And at that session, we're going to be talking about what it means to be a church member. And we want to invite anybody who's not a church member to come along and find out. And, and to think about, if, you, if you're here week after week after week, if you would say that uh, BC, uh, Broadmead is your home, then we would really strongly encourage you to become a member of this church and to share with us in that way and to be part of the program in that way. So that's first thing. So we're now, again, coming to a, a new book in, in our reading, it, reading Through the Bible in Two Years program. And we're actually changing style of books. Uh, if we have the next slide up, we can see that there are... Uh, the, the, the Bible is not, is, not, is not one book. The Bible is a library of 66 books. And of those 66 books, uh, 30, I always forget, 39 are in the Old Testament and 27 are in the New Testament. And in the Old Testament, there are several, several types of books. There are the law books written by Moses. Uh, there are the historical narratives. There are uh, prophetic books. And um, I have to check myself. Prophetic books and major and minor prophets. And then there is wisdom literature. And wisdom literature is quite different to the, the historical narratives that precede it. Wisdom literature is... Uh, is often poetic style, and usually it has the objective of teaching us some facet of knowing God. And of the five uh, wisdom books, uh, I, I had a little think this week to try to think, well, how would, how would I define them? And if we look at the five books, uh, as you can see that there are uh, five different ob objectives in the different books. So the book of Psalms is primarily talking about what it means to live in a world that enjoys God. Psalm 1, 1, blessed is the man who does not walk in the way of the wicked, is kind of an illustration of what it means to live in a world where God is in charge. Proverbs instead, Proverbs is teaching us about wisdom. What does it mean to be truly wise? And true wisdom is quite different from what the world calls intelligence or, or wisdom. Job, the book that we're reading through now at the moment, and the book that we're going to be preaching through for the next four weeks, uh, is about the problem of pain. What do we do when God, who's good, allows situations where there's pain? And uh, he says, I think John's going to be opening up a passage where he says, I know that my Redeemer lives. Ecclesiastes, we did during COVID, and that was a very special time to do that during COVID because it says, uh, we're living in a meaningless world. How on earth do we inject meaning into a meaningless world? And uh, I certainly got a lot out of that during COVID. And then finally, Song of Songs is, on, on the face of it, a love ballad. It's a love relationship between a, a, a man and a woman. But actually, it's talking about another groom and another bride. It's talking about Jesus the groom and us as the bride. But for the next four weeks, we want to be looking at Job. And what we're going to be doing is we're, we're going through four kind of key passages in the book of Job, which kind of help us to understand the whole book. Uh, the earliest reference to the book of Job is in Ezekiel. And Ezekiel mentions Noah, Daniel, and Job as three wise men. And he talks about Job as a, a real person. And the real person Job probably lived around the time of Abraham or thereabouts, very early on in the historical, in, this, in, this, in the Bible story. Um, but the book of Job was probably written maybe even 500 years later. So they had the story of Job. People knew the story of Job. as maybe an oral tradition. But then somebody sat down and he wrote the book of Job, which follows the story, but also comes at it teaching us about who God is and what he wants. So it'd be someone today, for instance, if someone today were to write a book about Julius Caesar, they would include all the stuff that's known about Julius Caesar, but they could then talk about his family maybe as a sub as a main point of that book. And this is what we have in the book of Job. And the author who wrote the book of Job, uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uses his in, in, in vast intelligence to speak to us about the nature of God when things go badly. 
He knows about constellations. He knows about meteorology. He knows about sophisticated mining practices. He knows about rafts made of papyrus floating on rivers. He knows about plants that grow in the marshes. He describes ostriches, eagles, mountain goats, hippopotami, crocodiles, and war horses. This is a, a, a man who's by no means simple and simplistic. A very intelligent person wrote this book. But this is wisdom literature. It's not historical narrative. And wisdom literature functions under different sets of rules to historical narrative. So what we would expect to see in wisdom literature is quite different to what we see in historical narratives. So it's very first start, it's a very long, it's a long poem. It's a 40, 45, 46 chapter poem. So you're reading poetry. Now, did the people in those initial meetings speak to each other in poetry? Probably not. But it's like Shakespeare. It's, it's poem. But also, in this first part that we had this morning, you have this weird situation about God's throne room and Satan creeping in at the back of the throne room, which I don't think is telling us a theological point about God's throne room. I think it's a device that is helping us to understand what's going on in the story of Job. Who are the players? Well, it's God, Job, Satan, and Job's friends are, just, are, are the actors in this. And the message that we're going to be looking at for four weeks is, how can a good God uh, not restrain evil and allow evil to happen? And we're going to be looking at different answers that emerge from the book of Job. So let's meet Job again. So we, um, uh, we have, we've had the reading, so I'll just read through very quickly from verse 1 to 5 of chapter 19, of, of chapter 1. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. Can we maybe turn the PA down a bit? Thank you. Should I turn off the mic? Okay. okay. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of fasting, feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. Um, the phrase, the word there is cursed God in their hearts. As we go through this uh, examination, keep your ears open for that phrase because it's used again and again and again about a response to God, which is not a loving response, but is a response of passive aggression towards God. So we have a scene. The stage is set. The chief angels are invited into the courtroom of God. And in the back of the room, Satan creeps in. And so God has a conversation with Satan. Where have you been? Here and there. What have you been up to? This and that. Have you seen how righteous my servant Job is? Have you looked at Job? And so it says, yeah, but he only loves you because you made him rich. If you, put a, if you put a hedge around him to protect him from evil. Take all that away and he will hate you. He will curse you. And God says, okay, put him to the test. And in one terrible day, he loses everything. His children are destroyed in, in, in an earthquake. His flocks are taken. His herds are taken. Everything is swept away. In the space of a few moments, this man who was a billionaire ends up with nothing. Nothing at all. Only the clothes that are on him. And what does he do? It says that Job got up in verse 20 and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground and worshipped and said, Naked I have come from my mother's womb. Naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. And chapter 1 comes to an end. Now we're in chapter 2. Back to the throne room of God. Again, God is meeting with his top angels. Again, Satan is creeping into the back of the room. Where have you been? He says. Here and there. What have you been up to? This and that. Have you looked at Job? Have you seen my servant Job? 
even though you, you incited me to take everything he had, he still, loves, he still loves me. And Satan says, yeah, yeah, but all the pain was external. All the pain was outside his body. Smite his body. Give him pain in his body. And then he will surely curse you. He will surely curse you. And what happens? God says, okay, put him to the test. And suddenly, Job, uh, sitting in that fire, in the, in the ashes, is now covered in boils. And it's all over his body. And they're extremely painful. And they're full of pus. And he has to scrape himself with pottery just to be able to sit down. And he's there in a terrible situation with no comfort. And his wife comes to him and she says, are you still maintaining your, your integrity? What did she say? Curse God and die. Just come on. Curse God and die. Let's get it over with. I can't stand watching you this way. And by the way, I lost children too. Curse God and die. And he says to her, are you crazy? Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And again, we see in all this, God did not sin in what he said. Job did not sin in what he said. And then his three best friends come. And they're so devastated by him, they sit there and they weep. They're weeping as they come into his presence. And they put, they put ashes on their own heads and they sit there with him for seven days without saying a word. It's so dramatic. And Job, sitting in the ashes of his life, looks, it up, looks up at us this morning and says to us and asks us, what on earth is going on here? What on earth is going on here? Now remember, the wisdom literature is teaching us about God, not about Job. Wisdom literature is there to teach us who God is, not who Job is. And the central character of God is he, he is in the center of all of this. And here we have a brutal accusation against God, a really brutal accusation. He says, he st Satan stands in God's courtroom and he prosecutes a case against the judge, against God. And he says, no one loves you, no one cares for you, no one wants you close to them. They only want you because you give them stuff. They only want you so that what they have will increase. They only want you because they want you to put a hedge around their interests. They only want you because they're afraid of hell. Take away everything and they will curse you. Wow. That's a pretty brutal set of charges. Someone comes up to you this morning and says, nobody likes you. That'd be pretty awful. But this is the God who's provided everything for everybody. This is the God who feeds everybody, who takes care of everybody, who's made everybody, who rules over the world, who loves people. And he says, yes, you've done all of that, but everybody still hates you. Everybody would still curse you. It's stomach-wrenching. And Satan's proposition is what we need to consider this morning. Is it true? Is it true that everybody just loves God because what do you give us? Is it true that we're all just here because we have some kind of secondary motive? Because we're looking for something from God. We're looking for him to do something for us. Well, there are many churches in the city and many churches on TV. You go there and they say, listen, if you pay a lot of money in the offering bag, uh, then God will make you rich. That's kind of this, isn't it? That's, I mean, that's exactly this. The more you give in the offering, God will make you rich. He's saying, people only love God because you make them wealthy. The fear of punishment may not be a very satisfactory motivator, but it does work. So many people come to church, and they come to church, and they, they kind of dip into to, to, to Jesus for, for a couple of hours, and then they go home and live their lives as if nothing changed, as if their lives were just their responsibility. And Jesus had nothing to say to them in their lives. And what they're doing is they're kind of keeping their ticket to heaven alive. They're keeping the, the down payment paying on that ticket to heaven. 
And deep down, they don't care about God. Other people are angry at God. Something happened. God let them down. He took something away. He didn't give them something. And now, even though they sing the songs and even though they say all the things they want to say, deep down, they're angry at God. They're furious with him. And you'd be amazed after the last 40 years as a Christian minister how many people in churches I've met who are angry at God, long-term angry at God. For others, they're offended by him. He's misogynistic. He's out of date. He must be bad because he disagrees with what our, our society says is true. These can all be for, described as transactional forms of Christianity. It's a transaction. I do this, you give me that. I do this, I come to church, you give me that. I do something to, for God, and he gives me something back. And they mask a contempt for him. They mask a heart which is cursing him. And if all those things are taken away, they will curse him. And that's just the people who call themselves Christians. That's just people who call themselves Christians. The world is full of billions of people who worship other deities, who demote Jesus to the role of a minor prophet. Others, others reject the whole spiritual world altogether and think that they can somehow magic God away because they just don't believe in him, and so he must disappear. We're not even thinking about them this morning. We're just thinking about the people who call themselves Christians. You might think that Satan has a point. Maybe Satan's right. Maybe we all just do despise God. Maybe we're all here just to get something from God. But God says, look, have you seen my servant Job? Look at Job. Have you seen my servant Job, he says. Look at verse, chapter 1, verse 20 again. He gets up, he tears his robe, he shaves his head, he falls on the ground in worship. He falls to the ground in worship. It says, naked I came in from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And in chapter 2, when his wife comes and says, to him, just curse God and die, what does he say? Shall we accept good from evil and from God and not, not trouble? Shall we accept good from God and not accept trouble? Shall we say yes to this and no to that? What does he tell himself? Three things. Everything I have enjoyed is a gift from God. Everything I have is a gift from God. For secondly, God remains God regardless of what he sends my way. God remains God regardless of how he responds to me. And thirdly, accusing God is unjust because God has done everything for us. His love for God is not dependent on God's performance. God remains God regardless of what he sends his way, and his response to this all is worship. Satan accuses God and says, no one loves you, everyone curses you. And God says, look at my servant Job. So let's just look at our, the servant Job. Just four real quick points of what he does. Firstly, verse 21, chapter 1. Naked I came from a mother's tomb, and naked I will depart. He understands that he played no part whatsoever in his conception, his birth, and his nurturing. All of that was done um, by his parents, by God, for him. He played no part in that. He understands that there will come a day when everything he has and everything he's got will be left behind. Famously, a, a famous millionaire in the a billionaire in the 70s, John Bolgetti, um, when he died, uh, one of the newspapers asked the question, how much did he leave? And uh, the, some wag wrote in and said he left everything. The minute your eyes shut in death, you leave it all. And he understands that he has no rights and no one owns him, owes him anything. He says, I have no rights and no one owes me anything. And I want to tell you that this is a powerful tool for well-being. A powerful tool for well-being. It's, power, it's powerful, and it provides a starting point 
for people who want to live a satisfying life. If you think the world owes you something, if you think that somebody, anybody owes you anything, then you will be reliant on them and you will be putting your trust in them and you will always be dependent on them. If you wake up and smell the coffee and understand that no one owes you anything, then you're suddenly free of those people that you might expect to give you something. Secondly, if you stockpile money and possessions, because in money and possessions lie your security, then you will never have enough. You will never have enough, and you will always be hungry for more. If you understand that every good gift comes to us from the Father of lights, then you'll be generous, and you'll give financially to church, you'll give other people, because you know God's going to provide whatever I give away and more. You will honor God financially. Job understands that he has nothing and nobody owns him nothing and that he will have nothing on his final day. Then what does he do? He fell to the ground in worship. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. He understands that there's a whole range of situations that are beyond his understanding. He senses that there's something going on here that is far bigger than him. As we follow the book through, we're going to be seeing this illumination coming to him, and he starts to see, oh, this is much bigger than than I really understood. He does, and he understands that just because he doesn't understand it doesn't make it wrong. Just because he doesn't understand it doesn't mean something's gone wrong. It just means something's happened, and he doesn't understand it. God is at work in his life, and when things are going well and when things are going badly. And so he worships. He worships. He consciously bows his head, sings and calls on God, and praises him. On the day he loses his children, on the day he loses everything, on the day he's with boils uh, on, uh, in, in, the, in the fire, he's worshiping God. And this is another powerful tool. This is another powerful tool. When something goes wrong, when something happens that upsets you, when something happens that you're uncertain about, don't sit there and get angry at God, but worship. Say, thank you, God, without being sarcastic. Thank you, God, for what you've brought into my life. Thank you for the situation. Thank you that you're at work, because I know you're doing something. And what will happen is a peace that passes understanding will guard your heart and mind. And you will be filled with joy, even in the midst of that situation. If you say, take a deep breath and say, Lord, I don't know what's going on, but you have not stopped being good. Thank you for the situation. Then you will know peace in that situation. Does it change the situation? Well, it may or may not. But what it does is it provides your head with a helmet of salvation. And it helps you in your thinking, and it helps you in your attitude. And you start to access supernatural power, supernatural power in a way which is transformational. In chapter 2, his wife says to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. And he says, Shall we accept God from good, from good from God and not trouble? She says, Are you maintaining your integrity? Why are you maintaining your integrity? What does that even mean? Well, he continues to live the Christian life. When all of this happens, he makes the conscious choice to continue worshiping, to continue serving, to continue laying his life down as a sacrifice to God and living the Christian life. When bad things happen for so many of us, what do we do? We slide into self-pity. We curl up on the sofa, watch Netflix, and hit the ice cream very, very hard. At least I do. Um, and, but that's not what he does. He says, no, I'm going to get up tomorrow morning. I'm going to do everything I've always done. I'm going to pray. I'm going to serve. I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to be there for what God wants me to do. And over the next 40 chapters, as we read the book of Job, it's a very long prayer. He's calling, to all, calling out to God all the way through. And God eventually answers. Why does he do that? Because he has discovered something. That the presence of God 
is his resting place. The presence of God is his safe place. The presence of God is his happy place. It's the place where he gets refreshed. When he's tired, he doesn't get refreshment from lying on the sofa watching Netflix. He gets refreshment from the presence of God. So he chooses not to allow sin and the rejection of God and the cursing of God to feed his lust. He chooses not to just press on with the lowest common denominator, but he continues to live his life in an integri- with integrity. And all of this is amazing for somebody who lived 4,000 years ago. But God this morning, he's saying to you and he's saying to me, have you seen my servant Job? He's saying to you, have you seen his servant Job? Have you really seen his servant Job? Because we have the privilege of understanding all of this in the light of the incarnation of God. We know that God himself came in the person of Jesus and he was stripped naked and he was put to death not on the the ashes but on the rubbish heat of the city. The father punished the son for all of Job's sins and punished the son for all of our sins. And Jesus hung in the dark and died. And he called out in despair the words of Job, "Why, why have you forsaken me? Because he was the only one whom God has ever forsaken. And he was forsaken for us. And we have his word, we have his spirit, we have the the body of God's believers, we have uh, the the life of the family, we have all of these things that have set us apart from Job. We have a thousand things more than Job, a thousand ways of understanding further on from Job. For Job, this is a leap in the dark. For us, it's much easier. But we have to understand that we have nothing and we are nothing. No one owes you anything. No one owes me anything. We have to understand that God is good all of the time. God is God and God is good all the time. And everything he gives is good. And this morning we need to embrace that line of faith. We need to look at Job and say, yes, I'm going to respond the same way. You know, the Bible has so many prayers. Uh, Job is full of prayers, but the Bible has many other prayers. And it'd be helpful for us, I think, if we were to say a prayer together. Uh, In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul writes a prayer. And what I've done is I've just taken the prayer that Paul has written, and I've personalized it. I hope you can see it all where you're sitting. But can you just take a look and read through that for a minute? He's praying that God will give him a spirit of wisdom and revelation that he could know him better, that his vision might have light, and that he might have understand hope. He's thanking him for the inheritance, and he's asking for the Spirit's power. Shall we say that prayer together? Shall we call on God together? I I won't say a little bit and then have you say, we'll just pray pray it the way we do the, the Lord's Prayer. That's okay. So will you join me in praying? Heavenly Father, May you, may, you give, may you give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation. I want to know you better. And may the eyes of my heart be enlightened to know the hope to which you have called me. Thank you for the riches of this glorious inheritance. Please release the wonderful power of your spirit in my life. Amen. Maybe you've never called on God this morning before. Maybe you've never called him, spoken to him. Maybe you've never asked him to to be in your life. If, if this is the very first time, we would love to just give you a little card of promises. And so if, you, if, you would, if this is the very first time you made this kind of prayer, just pop your hand up for a minute and Camardo will be happy to get, get, run a card to you. Thank you. So we're going straight into a time of communion. Okay. So... Um, Let me read from 1 Corinthians. Uh, 
Uh, can the team come up? I've, I've, got, I've got some instructions. There, there is, the bread and wine is on the balcony. Isn't that right, Janet? Up there somewhere. So if you're on the balcony, please, and you would like to take the bread and wine, please help yourself at the appropriate times. Uh, let me just read for a minute as, as you're handing out. As you're handing out, I'll read. In 1 Corinthians 10, 14 to 17, it says, Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourself what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there's one loaf, and we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one loaf. This bread that's coming around now is part of one loaf. And it's, um, it, it, it shows us the unity that we have with each other and with Jesus. The bread is broken the way that but the body of Jesus is broken for us. So please, as the bread comes along, if you know Jesus and love him, please take the bread and eat. Before we hand out the, the wine, we're just going to be, I'm going to pray before we hand out the wine. Jesus is inviting us to a meal. We host our friends with meals, don't we? We have people at our home for meals. Well, this is a meal that Jesus is providing. I mean, the food is his body and the drink is his blood. And this meal is temporary. It's like a Passover meal that's eaten in haste. Because one day the meal is going to be permanent. It's going to be with him in glory. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the blood of Jesus which is shed for us. We thank you for the body of Jesus which is broken for us. Even though we find ourselves in so frequently in situations which seem confusing and which are difficult to understand, we thank you that you are the one who loves us and gave everything for us. Forgive us, Lord, for the ways that we have so often held you in contempt and held your word in contempt. Forgive us, Lord God, even for the times we've cursed you. And I pray, Father God, that we might know you and trust you and live with you and seek you powerfully at work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. As the cup comes around, can you just hold on to the cup and we'll drink together.
Has everybody been served who wants to be served? The blood of Christ shed for us. responding now um, in song but also there there are other ways to respond to God's word um, and I really want to encourage you that if something that Mark said today has really struck you or or you know that something that he said that sort of sat with you in a certain way then I really encourage you we have a prayer team who are going to be in the corner over there and I encourage you to make use of that to, to get prayer especially um, if you're someone here and, and you're angry with God about something and you've been harboring that anger with God and you want to deal with that, and I encourage you to go and get prayer. Or, or if you're going through a situation in your life where you want to know the presence of presence of God as your comfort right now, then I encourage you to go and respond. Um, otherwise, I encourage you to stand, or you can sit and and respond where you are. But we're going to sing a couple more songs before we finish. So Lord taught me to see that though I fail you every day, your steadfast love will not fail me, but gladly bears my sin away. And then I see your holy fire consuming sin in mercy's blood. Righteousness and love required to ransom sinners to their God. Your cross, O oh Lord, taught me to weep. For there my sin led you away, and in the sun devouring grief as dark. Crowned our darkest day, and don't you think that I want to indifferent to your suffering? And oh, to see your sweat like blood, such depths of sorrow born for me. Your cross, O oh Lord. Taught me to love, for there I've tasted love divine. It fills my heart with power enough to make your costly service mine. No sin too great to meet with grace, no enemy too foul to bless. Your love. Captive soul is free, no guilt, no fear, no suffering can tear away your love from me. No song can reap such heights of joy, no tongue can tell such depths of peace, no vow, no time can end destroy the eternal. For Calvary, no song can reach such heights of joy, no tongue can tell such depths of peace, no power, no time can end destroy the eternal praise for Calvary.
from your hand. Father, we praise you. We worship you. For you are worthy to be praised. Father, whatever we're going through in life, whatever highs or lows we're going through in life, we thank you that we can worship you because you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You do not change. We pray that as we go through this week, may we, may we hold on to the joy it is to worship you and the peace that we have in you. May we continue to be transformed by the power of your spirit. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. That brings us to the end of um, this service. It's been a joy to worship with you all. There's, we're going to continue playing as a band, but there, you know, if you want to continue responding, the prayer team's still going to be there. 
um, or you can pray with someone around you. Um, but otherwise, there's coffee. Um, there's lots of people to chat to. Um, and yeah, I hope you all have a wonderful week. I'm just going to quickly read before we finish just some words from Ephesians chapter 3. Um, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.